Welcome back, geologists, for the second half of Cretaceous period. So some unique things appear in the rock record that are noteworthy to discuss, and snakes is one of them. Of course, we'll see a much stronger diversification of snakes in the Cenozoic, but they make their first debut during the Cretaceous period. Here's even a fossil snake. Isn't that pretty cool to be able to see one like that? This is an important development in the insect realm is bees. So we all know what bees do, they're pollinators. So that should give you a clue as to something that's going to evolve in the plant kingdom that will require pollinators. Our first eusocial bee appeared during the Cretaceous period. Obviously this is gonna be important for angiosperms, which is flowering plants now. What does eusocial mean? I'm gonna kind of talk about this for a minute. But basically mothers and other female individuals take care of the young and enable them to be able to repopulate so it's a self-sustaining community. So when bees figured out how to do this, there's a queen bee and they take care of her. The, the colony is all about taking care of the queen. They'll die for her as a matter of fact. Uh, so I was mentioning my ex-husband in the last uh, video. I'll tell you a little bit about him here, too. He was a beekeeper. And that was one of the things I just didn't really like to go out when he was getting his honey because it just had bad memories of being stung by some wasps when I was really young. And, of course, he'd wear all the gear. But one way that you can get bees to leave an area is to smoke them out and the smoke actually makes them think that it's time to go that their house is burning so they'll kind of eat and get ready to swarm to leave and so they're kind of uh, kind of not really in the mood to sting and if a bee stings you they're gonna die because it pulls their guts out so the evolution of the first bee where we end up getting these showing up in the rock record is a direct correlation to angiosperms and it's kind of an important detail regarding one of the most important evolutionary events of plants. So what else happened in the insect category? Well we know that insects flourished during the Cretaceous period and they had a good reason to. There was a lot of green stuff kind of like the end of the Jurassic period and we had a variety of new green stuff, things that were flowering plants that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture. So this provided new ecological niches and habitat for insects to fill. There were all types of insects, from ground insects to air insects and aquatic insects and everything in between. So insects are gonna flourish dramatically during the Cretaceous period. Pterosaurs lived during the Cretaceous period, but would finally go extinct. We know that they appear during the Triassic, but the largest pterosaurs of all times lived during uh, the very end of the Cretaceous period. And as a matter of fact, there was a species that was in Texas that's one of the largest ever. Now, when you think about pterosaurs, most people immediately go to that large creature, but you have to realize most of them were the size of grackles and crows. They weren't that large. But none of them are going to survive the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. That brings us to Cretaceous dinosaurs. So what's the trend with Cretaceous dinosaurs? First of all, Cerichian dinosaurs are going to gain their size, and that's a fact during as or compared to their Jurassic counterparts. And one area I would say is that's not true in is sauropods, but in theropods, that is definitely a, a factor. And we're gonna see the greatest diversification of dinosaurs alive. So I'm gonna let you in on a few of these thoughts about why dinosaurs went extinct or non-avian dinosaurs. And one of them is they got hay fever. So like, really? I mean, seriously, I'm sure that some of them did have allergies, but don't animals today, including humans. And allergies usually don't kill animals. So I don't think that that's probably the case, and I'm talking about like hay fever. I'm not talking about an acute allergic reaction here. 
So that's probably not the case. If anything, and it had, research has been done, the appearance of the first flowering plant and the diversification of angiosperms directly correlates to diversification of dinosaurs. Ornithischian dinosaurs greatly radiated during this time frame, and many more kinds than we'd seen in previous Mesozoic periods will be available by the end of the Cretaceous period. And by far, some of our most beloved dinosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus rex, were in existence at the very tail end of the Cretaceous period. And that's what you're looking at in this picture is a footprint. It's a bronze footprint from the Mesa Lands uh, Community College. They have the Mesa Lands Dinosaur Museum. And that's where this is on display. So as we go through this, remember that some of the things that you want to focus on for testing purposes would be when did they live? What does their name mean? And what kind of dinosaur are they? For example, if they're Cerichian, are they a sauropod, a theropod? If they're Ornithischian, are, what are they? Are they a Ceratopsian? Are they a Hadrosaur? What, what kind of class do they fall into? Iguanodons were very common during the early Cretaceous period, and they were not small. Sometimes I think that they get made out to be looking very tiny. Well, these guys got up to 10 tons, so I think that's pretty impressive in size. They were up to 33 feet long. They were some of the biggest hadrosaurs ever. And so while they were living during that time, they would have been traveling in herds. Sometimes you'll hear them in packs, but they were not hunting animals at all. Don't be deceived by this spike right here. That conical spike did not change the fact that they were herbivorous type of animals because they're hadrosaurs. That's what they are. Their name means iguana tooth. Protoceratops is just a type of ceratopsian. So when people say ceratops, they immediately jump to the conclusion that it's a triceratops. Be aware when you're thinking the term ceratopsian, it really it includes a variety. It doesn't just include one species. There were a number of ceratopsians, and this one is a very important one because it was a type of dinosaur that was common during the late Cretaceous right alongside uh, Triceratops. This guy was just much smaller. His skull got up to six feet long and most all Ceratopsians, that's one of the characteristics is they have a really big head skull in comparison to the rest of the size of their body. They got up to about two feet tall at the shoulders and weighed only about 400 pounds. So that's a far cry from what Triceratops would be. Then they are known for having one horn and the horns and where they're located and where these species live determines what species that you're looking at. They had uh, teeth that were very suitable for tough vegetation. They probably fed on low-lying shrubs and bushes and so forth, and maybe some of the new flowers that came out during the Cretaceous period. Their name means first horned base. Triceratops has always been my childhood favorite, and it is for many people. I don't know exactly why. I guess I like their big heads and their horns, and I just thought they were cool looking. They are very unique animals. They have a very long skull, a six foot long, I mean a pfft. Triceratops has always been my childhood favorite as a dinosaur, and I don't really know why. I just liked him. I thought he was cool looking. But his skull, wow. And I guess that's the first thing I noticed was how long it was. They can get up to 10 feet long. That's a lot of bone frill. And that's what sets apart Ceratopsians is the bone frill on their head. In addition, these guys were big. They got up to 12 tons, 7 feet tall at the hips, and then they can get literally 30 feet long. Wow, big, giant, long, super plant-eating animals. And their name means three-horned face. So when you think about Triceratops, just really think about it being one of the biggest species of ceratopsians ever and it was a late cretaceous triceratops but it would have been walking right in the same neighborhoods as protoceratops so it is incorrect to say that this was the only ceratopsian around this is a skeleton of a triceratops at 
the American Museum of Natural History on display there. And that really gives you a good sense of how big their heads were. I mean, their skull frill, what the frill always refers to this stuff back here, is just huge. And then each ceratopsian is going to have a unique set of beak in terms of the type of vegetation that they would have eaten. Corythosaurus is an interesting ornithopod dinosaur. So it's a type of hadrosaur, lived in the late uh, Cretaceous period. These guys were no runts. They were up to five tons, 33 feet long, and wow, they were pushing six and a half feet or so in height. And that's just at the hips. That doesn't include if they're standing fully erect and you can kind of see their heads pop up. Nevertheless, they have a special feature that kind of sets them apart and it is this crescent shaped dome that sits on their head. It's like a helmet right here and it has uh, extended tubes that formed very elaborate nasal passages which is kind of unique for some of the hadrosaurs. All hadrosaurs are herbivorous so corythosaurs would have been as well. Hypocrosaurus is the next dinosaur that we'll look at, and he is also a hadrosaur. All hadrosaurs are nithopods, again, living in the late Cretaceous. So I will tell you, this is a great test question. The most common dinosaur during the late Cretaceous is a hadrosaur. What a surprise, right? There were just so many varieties and types. These guys got up to 40 feet long and four and a half tons in weight. This would have been a nice picking for some of our apex predators of the time. A common characteristic of just about every hadrosaur is the fact that they have multiple rows of cheek teeth. So they don't have teeth like this. They have cheek teeth that grow in that are used for grinding down their food. And that's what these guys would have had. These also have extra extensions off of their vertebrae that produced a fin on the back of their neck because they look a lot like Corythosaurus with this kind of shape on their head, but they definitively have something different on their back. They have a fin. And uh, these guys would have eaten pine needles, seeds, foods, twigs, things that were in the forest floor or around for them to eat, including magnolia leaves, which is one of the first angiosperms that arrived. So his name means under the top lizard. Pachycephalosaur is a very interesting dinosaur for a number of reasons, but I think one of the first things we should point out is it's not a hadrosaur. It's actually under the same clade as ceratopsian, so it's more closely related to something like triceratops. They lived in the late Cretaceous right along with the Triceratops, and what makes them famous is their bony head. And when I mean bony head, they have a dome-shaped structure on their head, and in some cases, it's multiple inches thick, up to 10 inches thick, which gives them the name of thick-headed lizard. Well, they're up to 15 feet long, but they're not a very big dinosaur. They only weighed up to about less than a thousand pounds. They had a number of smart, small little sharp teeth that were designed to eat plants, fruits, and seeds. So as we talk about a story of these guys, I want you to keep in mind that they are in a different sister clay than uh, what we would look at with hadrosaurs. So when I was in high school, I had a softball coach and this softball coach was <laughs> He was very demanding, and uh, many times he'd call us Packy Heads, and we just thought it was a cute little nickname, but none of us knew what the heck he was talking about. And when we were being stupid, or we did stuff that he told us not to do, or we wouldn't follow his instructions, he'd go, Packy Heads. And we would just think he was like, okay, whatever. You know how you are when you're a teenager, right? And so it wasn't me until I got into college and I took my first historical class and learned about Pachycephalosaurus and what their heads really meant and their name meant thick-headed lizard. I had to laugh. I called him back and at a reunion went and saw him and I said, okay, coach, I get it now. I just, he about fell to the ground laughing so hard. He said, I guess you finally took geology. <laughs> and I was like, yep, I did. And he said, well, you get it now, right? So if anyone ever is being dense or being uh, stubborn, call them packy heads and see what they say. I mean, I'm never in favor of making fun of people, but teach them a, a little something about this dinosaur because it's really unique. 
We certainly know that they did headbutting, but I think really what some of the modern research shows is that Pachycephalosaura actually probably took their heads and butted into the sides of other animals uh, for habitat and food, uh, being able to have those resources because they are considerably smaller than most other hadrosaurs. So could they have butted heads against each other in mating? Sure, that's a real likely possibility. But uh, nevertheless, some of the research shows that they used this uh, tool that they had in their head for uh, self-preservation. Parasaurolophus is one of very famous dinosaurs of the late Cretaceous. He's an ornithopod, a hadrosaur. This guy has this bony crest on the top of his head. It's hollow, so a number of people think that they made a foghorn sound. You should do some research on that because some really interesting detailed studies on the bones of these guys and casts that have been made from bones have even had MRIs done on them and CAT scans to try to simulate the entire inside chronology of it so they could put musical sounds to it. So that it is really a fascinating thing to look into. This guy, his crest, obviously had a function because it is uniquely made in, in size and it the total pitch that would have come out of there is a low, a low sounding foghorn sound. And it is interesting to me as an instrument player and someone who's been in orchestra, this guy would have fit in with the uh, down with the trombone section. <laughs> I think it's pretty interesting that he could make such a sound for communication. These guys were pretty sizable, up to two tons, 40 feet long, and about eight feet tall at the hips. So they were nobody's uh, runt of the family. They had a toothless beak, very common for hadrosaurs, and numerous cheek teeth. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? His name means crested lizard. That really shouldn't be a surprise because of the large crest that comes off of his head. Ankylosaurus, also pronounced Ankylosaurus, depending on which region you're from. This has to be one of the ugliest dinosaurs that ever lived, but it is one of the coolest I am so enamored by this dinosaur. I just think what an ingenious development. This was such a heavily armored dinosaur. It even had eyelids that were armored. Go figure, right? Besides crocodile, I mean, besides, besides turtles, this thing is like the most armored type of animal that's ever walked the planet. Very exciting thing. He got up to 20 feet long. He was five feet tall at the hips and weighed five tons. This guy was a tank. That's what he was. He was an herbivore and he would need these plates to protect himself from predators. So if a predator were to try to get this guy, their best bet would be to flip him over because they have less protective uh, plates on their belly side. So that's one of the reasons they're very low to the ground. They're anchored down. Another really fun feature about this guy is its club tail. And I want to talk about this. His name means fused lizard, and it has to do with the vertebrae at the back of his tail. This is a tail that's actually on display at the American Museum of Natural History, and I've seen it. My photo just didn't turn out so well, so I had to use theirs. There are two large osteoderms, and again, an osteoderm is bony material, this stuff right here. And these right here are vertebrae, where the last seven vertebrae have been fused together. So what does that mean? It basically means that the animal had no flexibility in being able to swing their tail around. So I have a brand new cat right now, and she is something else. She's about 10 months old, so she's still kind of a kitten. and. And she can whip her tail back and forth. So she has a fairly flexible tail. Now, if she's an ankylosaurus, she surely would not be able to. It would be going bump, 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 bump. You know, she wouldn't be able to have her swift little snap that she has in her tail. But this guy does, and he's absolutely incredible. So this is a remarkable thing about this animal. So he probably would have turned to the side if he had a predator there and would have taken a, a hip socket 
joint. I mean, he would have taken his hip and whacked it backwards and took that tail and gave it everything he could and smashed it with his body weight. That would be enough to break the femur of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So this guy was impressive. Dromaeosaurs. Let's talk a little bit about Dromaeosaurs. So this is the sister clay to Aves. Important for you to know that. This may be the lineage that actually led to the development of birds. It appears that that is likely the case. It had highly derived uh, theropod, specifically raptor-type features. Now, it is a type of raptor. We've seen other raptors, right? So this is a very important guy. He had uh, large claws. He had a flexible uh, flight stroke that made from this the, his arms that came out, uh, that his forearms anyway, that he had. He had a very much a sharp set of chompers on him and very large grasping hands. So he kind of had a long tail, the s neck. He had big eye sockets, sharp teeth. These are all very much characteristics of theropods and certainly in terms of dromaeosaurs. So dromaeosaurs are feathered dinosaurs, specifically theropods, that got all the way from wolf size up to 30 feet long. So they were, they came in a lot of different sh shapes, but no bigger than medium size. And then there were some uh, raptors in the late Cretaceous that were pretty darn large. But this one uh, got up to medium size. Ornithomimus, this is an interesting ostrich-like uh, dinosaur from the late Cretaceous. And again, if you were wondering the K, let's revisit that for a second. K means Cretaceous. It was an omnivore. It was Since it's a theropod and it's cerichian, you would expect that it would be eating meat and it probably ate plants based on the shape and morphology of its teeth. So this guy got up to 29 feet uh, long from head to toe, has the classic body build of a theropod, about 8 feet tall and weighed up to about 33 pounds. So it was your typical size theropod, hollow bones, fast maneuvering, agile. His name means bird mimic. Velociraptor, the star of all of the Jurassic movies and most commonly the Jurassic World. These are middle-sized dromaeosaurs and they are raptors from the late Cretaceous. And obviously, you have, they are some of the most featured dinosaurs in any dinosaur movie simply because of the Jurassic Park series. A little bit more detail about these guys. Highly intelligent, and all raptors were. They had a big brain uh, casing for the size body that they had. So there is such a thing as dinosaur IQ. And some of your giant sauropods from the late Jurassic would have had very low IQs as compared to these guys, which had big brains for their size bodies. The misconception is they're as big as they showed them in, uh, in Jurassic Park. Velociraptor is small. They're about three or four feet tall at max. Most of them are around three feet tall. This is what they look like right here. They're real skeletons. They didn't get up to about 33 pounds. So, I mean, really, they are not very big animals. So what you see in the movies most of the time are larger raptors, but they're calling them Velociraptor. Giganotaurus is our next big theropod. And this one's an impressive guy. His name means giant southern lizard, and there's a reason. He's found in Argentina. He's supposed to rival and be the number one size dinosaur that beats T-Rex. And then even then there's some discussion if there's one more. So I've actually dug with a man who has gone to Argentina, uh, to Patagonia, to actually see and participate in a dig where they were getting one of these out of the ground. And these are impressive guys. They had skulls that were over five feet long, very sharp serrated teeth just like T-Rex would have had. And they got up to about 15 tons and 43 feet long. So they're very, uh, very large animals. So interesting that I should point out here that Argentina has a series of megafauna and they are from the late Cretaceous period that have not been found elsewhere in the world. And that's an important note to, 
to talk about uh, because of the location of where they were. Somehow they just were either in an isolated location or they had a, a, a location in terms of habitat and climate that was conducive for these big giant dinosaurs. Spinosaurus has become very famous after the movie Jurassic World. Its name means spine lizard. What's really fascinating about this guy is it has a huge sail, almost like Dimetrodon did back in the late Paleozoic. It's another really big difference between this guy and something like Tyrannosaurus rex is that its face, it's, it's actually got more of a crocodilian skull, but it is clearly dinosauria. So this is a very unique guy. Only been found thus far in North Africa. So there's more to come on this guy. If we start finding him and elsewhere, that'll be big new stories. So this big sail is its determining factor. And that, that, that sail got up to five feet tall. So, you know, wow, that's a lot of bony material right there. These guys had really tiny little skulls, but don't underestimate that for their intelligence level because their brain casing is pretty big. So we're to one of the most famous dinosaurs of all time, Tyrannosaurus rex. I can remember the first time I saw one of these fossils in a museum and I was just awestruck. I still am every time I see one. I don't care if there's a bigger dinosaur anywhere. This guy still has the number one slot in my book. He's just totally awesome. This is a Sirikian theropod, obviously. All the right clues, an s neck, serrated teeth, the big uh, socket right here, a long tail, bipedal, the small arms with claws, all of the right things that would indicate that he is a theropod. These were huge, 40 feet long, 13 feet tall at the hips, and up to six tons. This was a, a he was an apex predator in North America for sure of this time. His name means tyrant lizard king, so I think we can fair, safely and fairly say that in North America he still holds the number one slot, uh, being the biggest, the bestest, and the baddest. <laughs> and I really do think that this is an incredible organism when you look at just how detailed they are and how advanced these particular animals were. These were a late Cretaceous dinosaur. All right, we have to conclude the Cretaceous with one of the biggest drum roll moments in the history of plants, and that's the an appearance of angiosperms. Angiosperms are flowering plants. What's so great about flowering plants is they're found in just about every habitat, latitude, even elevation. Even some of them have figured out how to live in salt water. It's really amazing. These guys are so diverse and they make their debut during the early Cretaceous test question. Why is that important? Because by the end of the Cretaceous they will be dominating, but at the beginning they're not. We do have a direct correlation to the development and diversification of angiosperms to see in the fossil record with dinosaurs. The first angiosperm that was documented in the rock record is similar to a magnolia flower. So that's one of my favorite flowers simply because of its geologic history. So let's take a look at the disbursement of plant life starting in the early Cretaceous. And you can see ferns, cycads, conifers made up, ferns and conifers being your dominance right here and then everybody else over here except for angiosperms. Look at how small a fraction, so you're looking at less than 10 percent of the overall plant population at the early Cretaceous were angiosperms. Well that means 90 percent is everybody else, so it's going to flip-flop certainly by uh, the Cenozoic, but by the late Cretaceous we are probably uh, getting closer to 70-ish, 80-ish percent and everybody else being at about 20 percent. So certainly with the start of recent day where we are now, angiosperms make up 90 percent of the plant kingdom and everybody else makes up a small fraction of the remaining, the 10 percent that's left over. So by the late Cretaceous, angiosperms have found 
their niche. They're the number one plant around and they are producing flowering plants, which goes right back to the insects and bees and then new food resources, niches, so forth. And that gives dinosaurs something to eat. So there is a direct correlation between the evolution of flowering plants and diversification of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period. All right, there is definitely our fifth mass extinction Hall of Fame event that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period. So there's a kind of a story here. And originally I was going to do a complete lecture series on this extinction and the more I thought about it, really you need to know several main things and there wasn't really enough information to put a separate lecture together. So we'll just lump it in here. A couple of things died off permanently and then we're going to talk about the theories of what happened. A hundred percent of ammonites and belemonites went extinct. Bad deal for them. hundred percent of rutus, those are the little bivalves that have the lids on top. The stuff that makes up the Edwards limestone really in huge masses, those recumbent type ones. Cocolithosphorids went uh, pretty much belly up, and that's most of your chalk forming algae. That's the stuff that we talked about in earlier in the Mesozoic. Uh, then we had lots of loss of foraminifera, some diatoms, all the uh, radiolarians. So we had a lot of mass extinction in planktonic types of organisms. Now when it came to land animals, let's talk about this, 100% of non-avian dinosaurs. So that's all these guys that you call dinosaurs. So remember, avies are avian dinosaurs, so be careful on how you say that. 100% of flying reptiles and 100% of marine reptiles minus the sea turtle. So any of like Mosasaur, Plesiosaur, Ichthyosaur, they're all gone. All of them are gone. So this was a significant mass extinction event, the second worst of all geologic time. What are the theories? So knowing that this was such a big loss and especially famous for the loss of the, of the non-avian dinosaurs, there's a couple of hypotheses that are very plausible. And to be 100% honest, both of them together probably did the job. So when people ask me, what do you think caused the extinction of the dinosaurs? I'm going to have to say something went really wrong for them. I mean, we see a deathbed for, for real. We can actually see clusters of dinosaur bones, and then we don't see them anymore. So they were around, and then shortly thereafter, they're not. So what caused this death layer? Well, you see a big question mark in the illustration. You see volcanoes erupting in the bottom, and then you see what appears to be a meteorite collision in the top. Well, we're going to talk about both theories because they both have compelling evidence and some of the same evidence, I might add. The theory goes somewhat like this for the impact crater. The Yucatan Peninsula has a place, a town called Chicxulub. This is where the crater had been found. So you need to know there is a uh, father-son team, the Alvarez uh, bunch, that hypothesized that this would happen, and then they discovered the crater. There's kind of a story about how that came about. It was very controversial, and it still holds controversy. There is no controversy that it happened. Okay? The controversy is what's the cause of the demise of the non-avian dinosaurs. So everybody wants to hold their claim to fame of being the ones that solve one of the biggest mysteries of all of the paleontology or rock record that we have. A little bit about meteorites. Not all meteorites contain this, but iron-based meteorites can be high in a precious metal. So what's the story on the impact crater? First of all, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico is a site where there has been a 170 kilometer wide meteorite that struck Earth. Now there's kind of an interesting background story if you want to do some research. Type in Alvarez and you'll get information about the folks that discovered this and how it came to be. And this is an important crater. So they had already hypothesized, these guys, that there would be a crater simply because rocks with this special line right here, which is the KT boundary, known as the Cretaceous 
tertiary boundary. And it is just a couple of centimeter thick layer of uh, dust or clay that is rich in iridium. Why is that significant? Here's a couple of reasons why. Iridium, even though it's naturally occurring in the Earth's crust and inside of the Earth's mantle and even in, to a degree inside the makeups of the core, it is very rare element indeed. Now you need to know that it can be measured out of volcanoes that are even from this time frame. So volcanic eruptions can produce iridium just in much smaller quantities, and that's an important thing to note. So this very important um, metal that's in the platinum group is found in super high concentrations in not all meteorites, but in your, uh, your iron-based meteorites. So that's part one, is we got this layer, it's found worldwide, it's even found right here in Texas. A couple of other things that make clues for impact craters. Number one is shock quartz. Well, shock quartz is going to actually create a certain amount of crystal edges or prisms. And I will tell you, you can get shock quartz also from volcanoes. The difference is you'll see more of the crystal angles in the meteorite impact craters than you will on the volcanic. So there's, that's an interesting comparison there. Tsunami deposits. We can even see some of these uh, in central Texas where tsunamis flooded in the area after the Chicxulub meteorite struck Earth. Tektite is another type of deposit that we find, and this can also be caused by volcanoes, but essentially what they are is molten sediments that cool very uh, fast, so they kind of make a, a glassy texture, and this is a series of them that I purchased, and that's all the same stuff. So uh, usually the stuff that comes out of impact craters, there's a higher concentration and they're bigger in size than what they'd come from from volcanoes. Nevertheless, uh, they're, they're clues. There's actually one more clue that is important in impact craters, and certainly for proving that meteor crater in Arizona was an impact crater, and that's overturned strata, where older strata gets pushed on top of younger strata when the actual collision occurs. When you look at the volcanism, there is a lot of compelling evidence for the Deccan traps. The Deccan traps are right here, and this purple stuff represents a pretty big chunk of India. Now, I need you to go back and think about what was happening to India in plate tectonics. It's moving because of uh, plate movements, and it is volcanically active. So this area is producing massive flood basalts, much like we saw at the end of the Permian period with the Siberian traps. So this would have correlated to producing immense amounts of particulate matter, which is also one of the compelling pieces of evidence in the impact crater situation. The difference is volcanism does not keep the particulate matter in the atmosphere as long as something like an impact crater does. In addition, one thing it produces that you're probably not going to see the same as with an impact crater is some seriously poisonous gases. So it can impair air quality, which we suspect was the case that dinosaurs are probably already on the demise substantially because there is a time difference when you look at the age date of the lava flows for the Deccan traps versus what the age date is for the iridium layer. Not by much, but enough that you have to realize that there's a sequence of events that happened. So likely here's the deal. It appears probably the meteorite finished off the job. I think they were already on their way out the door with bad air quality, changes in climate, changes in the environment, lack of food resources, and certainly when the meteorite hit, basically it would have shut down the ecosystem long enough to kill out your primary consumers. Another thought that's added into all of this that you can't forget how major of an importance it is, is the regression of the Western Interior Seaway, globally that would be the Zuni Sea, right? So this large scale sea comes off the continents and as it does, these massive marine 
uh, reptiles that lived in the, our interior seaway and the ammonites that filled those spots, the, the other, like rudist and echinoids are, are, they just don't have anywhere to live. They're without a home. They're going to die, and some of them permanently die in the rock record. Echinoids are the exception. They continue on and thrive through the Cenozoic. So we know the mild climates throughout the Mesozoic changed radically by the end of the Cretaceous. Now we're starting to see more harsh conditions in terms of climate. So the availability of food, locations that would have been optimal habitat for dinosaurs was in decline. So I think you kind of have to look at this as a holistic uh, mass extinction event, kind of how I think we need to be looking at every mass extinction event, looking at the full story. So all of these things put together were shock factors to the ecosystem, leading to the demise of a number of important species. So let's look at the Cretaceous highlights. We know who this guy is. This is your packy head, right? So some things to remember. Pangaea continued to rip apart, and we got some big things that happened in the plate tectonics division, like Antarctica and Australia separating. We had the regression of the Zuni Sea at the beginning of the Cretaceous, then the full flood that occurred that was make the Western Interior Sea Ray a reality in our continent. We looked at the Edwards Limestone, the Comanche Peak, and the Walnut Clay. Do you know what makes the Cap Rock, the sides or the steep-sided hills, and then the floodplains and the kinds of fossils that we find in each? They're all Cretaceous in age. Angiosperms hit the rock record, which made great sense for dinosaurs to radiate and evolve. We would see the flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, reach their peak, and marine reptiles such as mosasaurs ruled the seas. Unfortunate for us, the non-avian dinosaurs would go belly up along with some of his friends such as the mosasaur, ichthyosaur, plesiosaur and of course all flying reptiles at the end of the Cretaceous period along with ammonites and rudist and a few other things to go with it. So it's a sad story at the end of the Cretaceous especially with our non-avian dinosaur friends but nevertheless they have gone extinct and that's what makes their bones so incredibly special when we find them but no less special than an ammonite or a rudist that you might find in the fossil record. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you the Cenozoic and the Age of the Mammals. So stay tuned for our next lecture series on the Age of the Mammals. Bye.